uh, Professor Igor Aronson with us here to give uh, uh, a seminar uh, on uh, hierarchical organization of communicating active swarms. Let me uh, give you a few details uh, on uh, the CV of Igor. He did his uh, undergrads, bachelor and uh, PhD studies at Gorky State University in Gorky, which is nowadays called Nizhny Novgorod. And he finished his PhD in 87. And then he moved on to uh, work as a postdoc at the uh, Institute of Applied Physics of the Academy of Sciences uh, in the same Gorky slash Nizhny Novgorod uh, city. And then he moved in uh, 91 uh, to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem uh, as a research associate. Uh, then he stayed for another probably three or four years as a senior lecturer at Bar Ilan University in Israel. And uh, then he moved to the US to the Argonne National Lab, where he went through a, a letter of different uh, positions. Uh, and uh, starting from 2013, he became there the theory group leader, and um, until which he uh, was leading this group, he was leading until uh, 2016, and then in 2017, he moved uh, uh, to the um, mm, Huck Chair of prof Professorship of Biomedical Engineering at uh, Pennsylvania State University, where he, he is since. He has a number of uh, uh, honors which he received amongst them. Maybe I want to mention the Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship in 91, and also the Alexander von Humboldt Research Award in 2019 and also uh, many others, including uh, being a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, he has a lot of uh, more than 300 uh, publications, uh, even some patents, which is quite unusual, I guess, for theoreticians. Actually, I also do experiments. So. Very good, okay. Uh, so that's why he has patents then. Uh, and uh, he has uh, in a very impressive um, uh, Google Scholar Index and a number of uh, many 70, more than 70,000 citations. And, um, and his interests are quite broad. He, uh, as you can see also from the topic here, but also working in Argo National Lab means also working on superconductivity, which I think he was also doing and maybe is doing, um, you know, working with other renowned um, uh, scientists. And uh, uh, it's maybe also a pleasure to announce that uh, we will have two lectures, uh, I think next week, correct me if I'm wrong, next week, yes. given uh, on the Lieberman-Bock-Landau equation. So please, everyone, join for these lectures. And uh, today, uh, let's welcome our speaker, well, Igor. Uh, thank you very much, Sergei. So this is a great pleasure. And I should say I know Sergei for many years, and I was one of the first visitors of this Max Planck Institute in Dresden, probably even before Sergei came there. This was 1993, I believe. Yes, it was before. Yes. And the, the building wasn't even finished. And uh, this work, uh, I will talk about uh, really complex, real complex systems. So it's, this is the center of, for complex systems, but these systems are really complex. And I'll talk about higher organization of communicating active swarms. And this work is done in cooperation with Professor Erwin Fry from LMU Munich and with uh, his two highly enthusiastic and talented uh, graduate students and postdocs, Alexander Zipke and Ivan Marishev. And let me give you a little bit, uh, just give me an idea of where I am now. Um, so you mentioned Argo National Lab, and I moved to Pennsylvania like six years ago. And the place uh, where university is located is called State College and equally close to New York, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, about three hours by car, which is America is a big country. You can see this is where we're located. So it's just in the middle of Pennsylvania. And so the university, uh, Penn State University, is one of the biggest universities in the U.S. It has about uh, 24 peripheral campuses and more than 100,000 students. And the main campus, which is in uh, State College, which is called University Park, has more than 50,000 students. 
and 17,000 faculty. And the place is really known for the second biggest stadium in the world. Uh, also biggest, the second biggest is, uh, I think it's in Korea. There's more than 100,000 seats. You can see the place, it's enormous. And the requested operating budget of our university is about $9 billion. And we also have a budget deficit about $500 million. This is the aerial view of the university. It's really a big place. And my building is somewhere there. Okay. So now let me talk about active meta. I will make a short introduction. So active meta is a wide class of systems actually consuming energy from the environment and transducing it into mechanical motion. <clears throat> and that's a very broad definition. And examples include suspensions of self-propelled particles, such as swimming bacteria, synthetic micro swimmers, as in bird flocks, fish school, human crowds, and many, many others. And the interest to active materials uh, for me is because these materials make heat properties which are not available at uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. Unlike ceramics, metals, plastics, these materials hypothetically can self heal, adapt to the environmental changes or change shape and behave like the living matter. And these are a few examples. Uh, these are bacteria which we may treat as active particles, they swim. These are synthetic micro-swimmers, which are, uh, in fact, conceived in Penn State University by my collaborator, now Ayushman Sen and Tom Maluk. And this is an example of, actually, from my research, this is an active turbulence, which are generated by bacteria swimming in liquid crystals. And the hallmark of active matter is a uh, simple interaction between the components, uh, like bacteria, uh, which are simple, like collisions, hydrodynamic, chemical, and magnetic, may produce complex emergent behavior, like swarms, bands, clusters, and turbulence. Okay, the, the bird eye view of active matter, the central paradigm is to understand the onset of collective behavior from short range interactions, which is actually very similar to the main paradigm in condensed matter. And the challenge is how to conceive simple uh, interacting uh, active agents with functional, autonomous, intelligent like behavior. And what we really want to develop uh, our desired capability to introduce shape memory, self healing capability, ability to detect threats and to deliver payload or migrate in the desired direction. And now let me show a few examples of intelligent like behavior. This are a mix of bacteria and uh, by simple collision like interactions, they can self organize and coherently moving flocks or swarms as you can see. And this helps this uh, microorganism to survive under harsh conditions. This is example of uh, okay. blocks of birds, which self-organize into this uh, large uh, blocks, uh, and uh, this way they can fend off uh, in predators and increase their survival. Uh, Probability. So why are these uh, bacteria, uh, why is it helping them to flock uh, under, as you say, harsh conditions? Well, so, so when conditions are harsh, they self-organize, form these flocks, and they form fluid body, uh, fluid body and uh, sporulate. So this way, they, when many bacteria, they can sporulate and produce many spores. Individual bacteria would produce, not, wouldn't produce it. Yes. So in the picture there are those small dots, black dots. This one? Uh, yeah. I think that's dirt. Okay. It's for, actually from my lab too. So it's... Okay, so I should say that unlike uh, bacteria and birds, uh, uh, highly intelligent beings like humans actually show very simple behavior if you put them together. This are uh, results of computational modeling from uh, this group. 
and they study the behavior of pedestrians and what they find that uh, they do something very simple. For example, if they put them into closed room, they just uh, wander aimlessly and go to self -care. And if you put them in front of the open door, like here, they got stuck. Mm -hmm. So I should say bacteria actually know how to escape bottlenecks. So humans don't. Well, they also pretty well escaped. At least some, uh, some <laughs> but <laughs> many of them got stuck in the corners. Yeah, but we saw it in the last year that it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah, okay. And that let me show a little bit more uh, connection to condensed matter physics. This is again research from my group when I was in Argonne. And this was done with Baikin uh, Shigushka, who is now a professor at the University of Tokyo. He visited us a few years ago. And we did this experiment, which was in fact motivated by pink of superconducted vortices. So we fabricated these micro pillars. They like this is the idea. So these micro pillars arrange them in the square lattice, and then we fill it up with uh, suspension of green bacteria, as you can see here. And uh, what we observed that that uh, bacteria self organize into uh, highly ordered ferromagnetic lattices. So what you see here, red corresponds to bacteria rotating clockwise. And blue bacteria are like kind of clockwise. And so they form um, this uh, anti, almost perfect anti ferromagnetic lattices and even form H currents around them. So it's behave almost like a biological condensed matter. Okay, so if you are really uh, curious and want to build your own active matter, in fact, you can do it. You can still do it, I should say, because the company which produces these micro robots now is going out of business, but you still can buy it on eBay. So you can buy a bunch of robots and you can program them and, and study. You can program interactions and study self organization. Okay, but so what so far I talk about very simple active matter, active particles which do very simple things. Call it stupid active matter. So they just move in a certain direction and uh, interact by some simple physical uh, uh, interactions like hydraulic entrainment, like bacteria or mechanical collisions. So, but in the reality, in biological and synthetic world, uh, actually many microorganisms have, have an optical stimulus, they have the capability to make a decision. So, this is an example of aggregation of. Uh, um, uh, amoeba, Discasterium discadeum, which uh, communicate via chemical signals, so which called C, A, and T. And this amoeba, uh, actually, in addition to just releasing this chemical, they make very simple decision. So if the concentration of chemical exceeds a certain threshold, they relay the signal, they re-emit the same chemical. And this way, they can self-organize in much faster ways than non-communicating microorganisms. So, and you can see they, they stream towards this organizing center and form this rotating spiral wave. And this way they can uh, uh, cluster much faster. And this again increases the survival probability because this way, if conditions are harsh, they, they don't have enough uh, nutrient, they can self-organize, uh, form these clusters. And in these clusters, they can sprolate much more efficiently. You also see something like that in the synthetic world. This is uh, uh, experimental results from the group of Professor Sam, the same Sam. And they studied the uh, aggregation of uh, silver chloride colloids. And actually, these colloids also release some, um, it's actually chemical, it's, they release some ions. And because of the ions, they can oscillate and aggregate much faster. And, and what is the... Uh... How can we view this as an active matter? So where's these the particles energy? can move. Uh, but where's the energy coming from? Uh, energy comes from the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, which they add to the solution. So this uh, silver catalyzes hydrogen peroxide, and it actually creates energy. And this they oscillate and they move towards it. Uh, okay, these uh, microorganisms they can see some nuclear. So of course you need energy. So, and this uh, communication, decision-making, active matter, in fact, is a big topic in popular culture. May so, I ask you one uh, 
question. Yes. How many uh, bacteria or uh, the robots uh, you needed to simulate uh, this kind of the? No, not too many. Not too many. Not too many. Not too many. No. For example, the av Avogadro numbers or like that. Not Avogadro number, maybe hundred. Enough. Yes, hundred is enough. Yes. <laughs> yes, and uh, intelligent taxi of made in popular culture is quite active here. So I highly recommend if you didn't read these two excellent uh, bestsellers. One called uh, Der Schwarm, I believe, was translated and called now Der Schwarm. Uh, it's a little bit sick book, but uh, it's, uh, the punchline is biological active matter, kind of amoeba, genetic uh, with some de genetic memory. Uh, became hostile and attack, attack uh, human beings. And this another one, this is actually synthetic active matter, became hostile and attack human beings. Uh, okay, the humanity was saved in this case by a group of uh, heroic scientists, a few different, and here uh, by the magnetic field. So, in the case that you knew robot, uh, do you mean like you? Yes, micro robots, yes. Um, uh, Evil corporation created a swarm of micro robots, and they. I have a question for the the previous part. So basically, you don't need to to <laughs> to move. So basically, my question is as when you study the the micro robot, does it mean that you program the robot to follow some rule? Uh, some very simple rules, yes. Very simple rules. You don't really these robots don't think. They think. And then, can we? Uh, perhaps the microscopic equation of this. Yes, uh, I come uh, into it. Yes, there will be a lot of equations. But with that, but we you, you will lose some kind of like conservation law, right? Uh, let me talk about that. There will be a lot of equations. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So now let me talk about equations. So models of active matter, and there are two types of models of active matter. One uh, model is based on part. Um, discrete particles and other kind of models are based on continuum equations. And I start with discrete particles because it's more intuitive. And uh, basically what is assumed, uh, and it's actually interaction rules are very simple. So you have a, part, a bunch of particles uh, and these particles are self tropical means they move in a certain direction with a certain velocity. And then you need to introduce some very simple interaction rules. For example, if they collide, they align their orientations. That's what are the interaction rules. And uh, these interaction rules are cast in terms of very simple mathematical model, which are called the Bishop type models. Uh, it's from uh, uh, Thomas Bishop and actually Ben Jacob that came up with this uh, idea in 1995, I believe. And the equations are very simple. So it's to assume uh, driven over damped particles, so no, uh, no effect of inertia. So velocity rather than acceleration are proportional to the applied force. And the justification is usually these particles move in a very viscous environment. And then we assume a strictly local interaction range. And alignment happens according to the average uh, direction of the neighbors and simple update for the position and orientation of the particles. And uh, this is not necessarily reproduced uh, phenomenology. So, that's, so what we do, we have particles which move, then we select a neighborhood uh, and all particles within that neighborhood, we align in a certain direction and add a little bit of noise. So this is a very simple update algorithm. So if you really want to read more about it, I recommend uh, this review by Krug Chate, Dry, Alani, and Dilute Active Matter, which published a few years ago in uh, annual reviews of standard matter physics. Why is it dry, not wet? Okay, uh, okay, this is uh, kind of jargon because dry means that uh, interactions are of this time. So, hydrodynamic interaction would introduce, if we consider like bacteria, this makes uh, all this much more messier. Because you have long range hydrodynamic interactions. So it's just short range versus. Yes, range. yeah. And uh, plus a little bit more than that, but mostly that. Okay, so this is how you cast this model mathematically. So it's 
position and orientation of the particles are described by positions by x, velocity by v, and orientation by angle theta i. And uh, the velocity, which is dx dt, is some um, v naught uh, prescribed velocity multiplied by the unit orientation vector, which is cosine theta sine. Theta. So this is a Newton equation for individual particle. Very simple. So each moment of time, then you select a neighborhood of each particle, for example, a circle of radius r. And within this circle, you realign the particles according to average orientation and add some noise. And then you update the particles, they, they just trim in the direction of orientation. So it's uh, enthusiasts can program this in five minutes, probably, so it's, uh, it's not hard. Okay, this was published in uh, 1995, and that time scaling flows were very hard. And uh, in this paper, they predicted new scaling slope by, for modified XY model, and it happens to be incorrect. So the system doesn't show any scaling at uh, the transition point, but uh, the model became extremely popular. But in this case, uh, v, v, I, and theta I are redundant, right? Excuse me? V, I, and theta I are redundant, right? It's not independent. No, V, I, and theta I, so V, I depends on theta I. So you, okay. so you have velocity and you have orientation, but velocity is overdone. So let me show what uh, this is the uh, state of the art simulations of 2004, one million of these particles. Uh, that time it was a big deal. Uh, they run on the biggest uh, computer in France, I believe, at that time. So where you can see. Sorry, where it was the interaction? So interaction uh, only here. So you select a neighborhood and you realign the orientations. Okay, and uh, so in that simulation, what is the relation between a uh, mean distance between the particles and this uh, radius of neighborhoods? It changes a lot, so it's, <laughs> you don't impose it, so it's, so you use a random reductivity of the particles and then they evolve, you don't do anything else. So, and you just, so parameters, so simulations are, so the number of particles which you distribute, uh, the radius of interaction is like, usually it's one, you can scale it, and the amount of noise. One compared to what? A particle has zero size. No, but uh, still, I mean, so yeah, mm -hmm. what means one? Radius one was the average distance between particles? Is that what one is? No, it's not average distance between the particles. So, to, so it's, uh, you can take any parameter. So you, so, okay, so you have a domain of size L and introduce one million particles. And essentially it depends, uh, on cri the critical density would depend on this interaction radius and the noise. So it's uh, some parameter which uh, you can change. So parameters are V naught, this interaction radius, and they are related. So it's, yes. Oh, excuse me, could you, I can hear from here. Yeah. You can introduce many things. This is the simplest model. And then you, if you look at number of publications, so people introduce all kinds of interactions. You can introduce frustration as well, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, does this model uh, include damping? Uh, it's over, all, already over them. So you can consider under them. It's make some effects too. But this is the simplest model, whatever possible, yes. So now let me show you what happens if you simulate this. So it's, uh, you start with random initial conditions and then this particle start to flock and they coalesce and they form after a very long time, they form a band when all particles move in the same direction. This is purely boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a state of the art of 2004. Now you can do maybe a couple of orders of magnitude more, but it wouldn't change the conclusion. So you see that after a long time, particles start to move in a certain direction, and this direction it depends on the initial conditions. But is the redundant longer time? Oh, it's 20 hours of simulation, create something like that. It should be compared with some... It depends uh, on many factors. It depends on the number of particles, uh, system size, 
amount of noise and interaction radius and radius. So it's everything is independent. So they're not independent parameters. So it's like interaction radius and the density are related. So it's so what part is? of the initial condition it tells you uh, the direction? Uh, it's random, so it's... Uh, it's just uh, the, yeah. the average which will tell you... The average the probably, will, I'm not can... sure that average will tell you, but it's essentially if you... If system is very large and you start with different realization, you may have these bands moving in any direction. So it's... So uh, if, if we start from the same initial condition, we will we obtain the same direction. No, but we have noise, which is not unrelated so noise. Not if, we, if, if we have the same noise, yes. But technically, noise should be given, able to change the direction if you wait long enough. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, so this is, uh, once you have this band, uh, then there is a self averaging of noise. So it's, 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 it's yes, yeah, so you need to wait exponentially large time. Could happen. Yeah. In the finite system. Yeah. 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 In the finite system, it might happen, yes. Okay, so this is what's about uh, simple active matter, which uh, studied in great detail now. I spent a lot of time doing that too. So now we decide, okay, so but what happens if we uh, introduce a new feature? And uh, this uh, new feature is the following. So, so we have the same active particles, so they move and they collide, they align, but now, and they also release a certain chemical signal. For example, some CMP like uh, amoeba. But now we add extra feature. So extra feature is that they can make very simple decision. And this decision is like this. So if they detect a signal, which is above a threshold, they generate a pulse. And this uh, uh, dynamics, uh, this capability is described by this simple electronic circuit, which is called a Schmidt trigger. Wait. Uh, so they detect the signal. What is the signal? Some For example, space? some chemical. Something which is something in space. Yes, something. Space in, space in, right? Yes, in space, yeah. yes, which is diffused in space. And uh, they detect, uh, if it's above a threshold, they release a pulse of some chemical. Meaning that they will do again something. They will change this environment. They will realign, the, yes, uh, modify the environment. The environment yes. locally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and the dynamics of peak aging is described by this simple electronic circuit, which is called a Schmidt trigger. And this velocity is affected by this signal. Well, we will come to it, yes. The velocity is not affected, but uh, orientation may be affected. Yeah, orientation will be affected. So, because so now if uh, agents uh, release the signal and they align in the direction of the strongest signal, so they will dynamically realign, uh, modify the landscape of this chem chemical landscape. And they move it in the dynamic landscape and a lot of bad good thing, whatever you call it, may happen. So this was the idea to enrich this uh, simple active matter with a new capability, but namely very simple decision-making capability. What happens? So we published it last year. So it's, uh, and we observe the uh, universe of new structures. I will talk about that. But now about equations. And okay, this is the idea of the model. So we have individual dynamics, which is the same as an Abishic model. But in addition, so we have collective interactions, which is steric alignment. And but we have also decision making capabilities. So each agent. If it uh, detects a signal, so it releases it, and this affects individual dynamics. Why like chemotaxis like it? So as each agent moves in the direction of the strongest chemical, but if other agents release the same chemical, so they will dynamically modify the chemical landscape. So this, uh, the system becomes uh, very dynamic. So wait, so so the decision is only release or not, but not yes. change, but not no, change. not change the reality. No, no, the decisions are very simple. So it's as simple as possible. So it's just release or not, not. And do you assume that uh, if if uh, no one is releasing anything, there's still some kind of uh, chemical potential landscape? Yes, uh, but do as you I assume don't... that this thing is uh, is constant or is it decaying? In time? It's will really evolve. Yes, it will decay in time. Yes. If nothing happens, it will decay yeah, in time. Yeah. That's what you. Yeah. Assume. So the chemical will degrade in the medium. Yes. Okay, so now about equations of the thing. So it's uh, 
So the first part of the same as in a Vichy model. So it's uh, we have particles which move in the direction of orientation. Uh, it's a unit vector, and uh, we also add spheric repulsions. We don't want these particles to be on top of each other. So they have finite size. Unlike in the Vichy model, so it's in classical Vichy model, they have zero size. And it creates a lot of troubles and some limits. So we all particles have a uh, finite size. So does it mean what happens when they come to close? Will they repel uh, like uh, billiard balls? Or like billiard balls, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so hard core repulsion. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so in which model, because they have zero size, you may have infinite density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's also important. So does it mean that when they touch, they don't uh, reflect the uh, velocity? They, they don't reflect, so they're not elastic. They're fully inelastic. Mm -hmm. They're not like billiard balls, which, uh, uh, yeah, so they're inelastic. They come together, they move together. Move together. Oh, they just start to stick together. Yeah, yeah. Almost, yes, almost, yes, something like that. So the orientation of the particles are described by this equation, which is a continuum analog of uh, the Vishik model. So you can write Vishik model originally was formulated in discrete, uh, as a discrete map, which uh, technically is more convenient to work with continuum equations. And this almost like a lattice of Jacobson junctions, right? Very but, uh, but where so this you meant in time, right? Yes. Before, so, because yeah, you yeah, had to make these decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and, this now is, you, and now you do this continuum time. time. Continuum time, yes. So it's uh, now you can understand this as following. So this is interaction radius, okay. And this is the distance between the particles, so which means that uh, pa remote particles produce less effect. And this is aligning terms. So if so, um, so this particle will have the tendency to align with the orientation of uh, neighbors with the rate gamma. And so this term describes uh, the tendency to align along the strongest signal. It's called chemotaxis. And the last term is the mass. So this is a discrete, uh, this is continuum analog of the Vishak model. So why are the angles? Yes, why are the angles? So previously it was theta. Oh God, sorry, yes. <laughs> here, the, here are phi's, yes. The absolute value of the velocity is not changing. It's not changing, but. Just not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where are the so positions? Where are the positions? And positions are described by this equation. Yes, so this is uh, position uh, xi dot is vi. This is the point. This is an ordered differential equation. 2D. 2D, yes. Could be 3D. So it is. So. Yes. I don't know. I received all this emergency signal from Mimi Karin all the time. Yeah, never give them your telephone number. Yeah, I said. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so then we have equation for the evolution of the signal. So we assume that uh, each particle emits a certain chemical. Which is uh, described by the continuum fields. In your previous slide, have the, the term with omega. What is that? Excuse me, what is omega? Omega, omega is chemotaxic sensitivity. So this is uh, sensitivity of particles towards uh, with respect to the uh, signal. Okay. Is it a threshold? A threshold uh, is there is no threshold for that. No, this is uh, the threshold will come later. What is what is phi? Phi C. Phi C is uh, uh, arc tank of the angle of gradient of curve C. So it's uh, Phi C is uh, arc tank. So this is a uh, direction. So, uh, so without labels, the, uh, the uh, active particle it will move will in the direction of. Along the gradient yes. of this chemical yes. field. Yeah. 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 Okay, so and the chemical field is described by the diffusion equation. So this is the diffusion of the chemical. This is the degradation rate. And now we assume that the particles are the sources of this chemical. And uh, phi describes uh, the shape of the particle. And just we, for simplicity, we consider it as spherical or disk. Disk and beta is the amount of chemical to be released. And the function phi. Uh, this uh, in, actually encodes uh, the re uh, release of the chemical. The, here was a threshold case. 
So it's uh, phi is zero if the signal is uh, below threshold and uh, one is above threshold. And this function depends on the state of the agent. So each, now each agent uh, endows, uh, endowed with a certain state and this state evolves. And if uh, the agent detects a signal, so it changes its state and changes its function phi. And now it comes to this uh, state of the agent evolution. This evolution is very simple, in fact. So the state of the agent is some coefficient epsilon multiplied by C minus gamma CI. So if there is no signal, so the state of the agent will relax to zero. So if there is a signal, so the state of the agent will increase uh, with a certain rate. And now uh, the reaction described by this function. So this is a theta function. Uh, which is C minus some threshold, which depends on the state of the age. Okay, so this is what uh, we have. And if you consider a uniform system, so it's uh, the chemical is distributed uniformly in space, so you can solve these two equations. And what you find out is the following. So uh, you can believe me, I did this math. So you can draw a phase diagram. So you can, uh, and what you find out, there is a curve, and uh, oh, there is a line, in fact. So there is a line, and if you're below this line, so it's uh, your state of the agent will relax to zero. But if you're above this line, so you will uh, execute a long excursion in the phase space, which corresponds to generation of a large pulse. So this, this way, this dynamics of a Schmidt trigger is implemented. And then you can uh, solve this system uh, or you can coarse grain. So this system you can solve like a, it's a kind of mixed model. It has this uh, Vishik part and it has this part. Or you can coarse grain it, which is interesting by itself. And uh, you can write down the equation for the coarse grain uh, quantities. And coarse grain quantities are the density of the agents uh, or concentration of the agents. And they average orientation, which is called polarization, polar orientation E. Okay, so it's not easy thing to do. And uh, first works, uh, actually, we did first for 2005 for microtubules and molecular motors uh, with a left simmering. And uh, later it was uh, published by Eric Bertin uh, drawn in Vibuar, and they specifically consider it for the Vishik model. So we have the same equations, but we actually did it for a different system, not for the Vishik model. And what you obtain is actually quite interesting. So if you cross grain, so for the Vishik model, you obtain these two equations. So one equation is for the concentration of the agents rho, which is simple, it was like a continuity equation. So it's so it's, you have you know, time derivative of a concentration, which has diffusion, and this is like a, a divergence of the um, polarization vector. It's like a continuity equation. And second equation for average orientation. And it uh, reminds, uh, I missed one term here, it doesn't matter. So it's also diffusion here. But, the Dean will plan the equation for superconductors. And where is noise in this equation? Actually, it's uh, noise uh, should be a diffusion term. Diffusion of P is, is here. Okay, so it's uh, so you have uh, this term. So if concentration is larger than the critical concentration, so you have orientation transition. And you also have coupling to the density here. And there is some resonant trivial term here, which is due to active nature of the system, due to ability of particles to move. So you have also this term. So do, I, do I interpret correctly that at high density so of agents, uh, the, uh, in fact, the amplitude, the strength of noise is not, is not significant? It's not significant, yes. Yes, exactly. And uh, so this was derived originally for, 
Okay, correct. Uh, so it's originally what says equations were derived in the dilute limit. If we introduce re uh, hardcore repulsion, we need to modify it, and this is really very difficult thing to do. Uh, so a shortcut is to introduce a kind of pressure which depends on density. And this can be done semi-analytically into limits and then can be matched and then it works very well. Uh, okay, and uh, finally we need to coarse grain equation for the chemical field and for the state of the agents and there will be like two equations like that. Well, this is quite complicated things to do. I will go very briefly. Let me show what happens. So if you do it, uh, what you obtain, uh, variety of patterns which you don't see anywhere else. So we obtain formation of rotating rings, droplets, streams, vortices, bands, and they both obtained in the uh, agent-based model and the in-continuum model. And the agreement is very good. And uh, so these rotation rings, they have some waves propagation on the, around the rings and the vortices, they have spiral waves. Um, and uh, the agreement is really very good. And the, here's the phase diagram. So we have the signal susceptibility omega and the motility of the agents v not. So there are two main parameters. And depending on the parameters, you have vortices, rings, streams, or anything. Else. So let me show you the uh, results of uh, comp computational modeling. So this uh, continuum equations, solved, continuum equations are solved, and you see formation of large clusters, which are stabilized by rotating spiral waves. In addition to vortices, uh, you also observe rings. It happens to be that rings are somewhat less stable than the, than the vortices. They often break up if there is a vortex around. What, what is the color? The angle? Excuse me? What is color? See. Color is orientation angle. angle. It's an orientation angle of the direction of motion of the agents. And there are also streams. So that's a... Uh, this... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so these objects are streams, so when the agents move in a certain direction, and many other patterns, which... Uh... So what is actually surprising, so it's... Uh, we did not intend to describe any biological system, but it happens uh, that uh, amoeba, this Castellum discardeum, under certain conditions, uh, they say mutants. Uh, I don't know what exactly they changed. So they developed its... Uh, aggregates with tails. And our model actually does it, so it's... So we see this formation of aggregates with tails. And it's written. Um, so the next question, what we can ask, so we have really complex uh, immersion behavior, and we see formation of droplets, streams, vortices, and they aggregate. And it looks like there is a hierarchy of, hierarchy of scales, and so, so if you study the system on a really large scale, you see uh, hierarchical organization from vortices, from droplets to streams, streams to rings and vortices, and then vortices coalesce on much larger scale. And uh, uh, clustering and coarsening and active matter is a big topic. And uh, typically it was studied in the following setting. So it's assumed that when particles collide and the concentration density increases, so they slow down. And this phenomenon is called uh, uh, motility induced uh, phase uh, separation. And it's uh, very similar to equilibrium muscle tracking, even the exponents are the same. And this was studied in really great detail in a number of papers. So it's, uh, so it's in this system, the situation is very different. So if you look at the number of clusters as a function of time, so the motility induced phase separation would give uh, T minus to zero. And what we see, it's very different. It's more similar to finite time aggregation. And this makes sense because basically all the agents aggregate once a wave propagates throughout the entire system. 
So it happens much faster, and that's what more or less consistent with this behavior. And uh, even more, so you can separate uh, aggregation curves with different structures, for example, for droplets, things and vortices, and what you can see that in the beginning, we have formation of droplets, but then droplets merge into streams, and the streams give way to vortices. And asymptotically, you have only vortices, and they aggregate very slowly. I have a question. And did you did you check uh, opposite uh, opposite response with respect to gradient? So normally normally the agent wants to align to gradient, but what if he wants to go in opposite direction? We did not check, but I think in this case we would have uh, um, dispersion of the agents. Yes, yes, uh, yes. They should avoid each other. Yeah, and then you have but, uniform, uh, uniform density state, which is still be active. Yeah, yeah. Which will be more similar to turbulence. So it's yeah, yeah. we didn't check it, but for, for, for this situation you do not observe some turbulent like uh, not really, no. But we did. But uh, let me tell you a little bit more about it. So it's uh, then okay, so we have uh, agents which process information, and the question is how we can characterize it. And here we came across all these publications. So how to evaluate amount of information in the system. And the idea is very simple. So if you have a continuum, continuous field, you can discretize it. And the amount of information would be um, the size of uh, the file after lossless compression, which is you can use LWZ compression, which is lossless. Essentially, if you have an image, you convert it into PNG, and PNG is using LWZ compression. Yes. I can hear you. Excuse me. Okay, so if you use uh, 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 loss compression, so it would depend on your solution. Uh, it's hypothetically, they should give similar results. Which checked few. Uh, there are actually various versions of uh, LWZ, and there are some more come efficient. So we use the most efficient, which we could get. Yeah, there are a few versions of LWZ. Yeah. But the results are very similar. So it's essentially you have an image, you can compress it, and it gives you an amount of information. And we can measure it from our images. And uh, what we see is the following. So, it's, so in the beginning, we have a lot of information and, uh, because we start with random initial conditions. And then the system evolves, it decreases information, then it does something, uh, and then it flattens when you have only very few vortices, information is very small. And we also can calculate the information processing rate. So, information processing rate is uh, how many agents are above the threshold, so which process the information. So we can measure it independently. <coughs> so we can measure it independently. So it's a fraction of agents above a certain threshold. And what we anticipate is the following law. So the change of information is uh, information processing rate, which generate information. And there is a decay because system evolves towards an equilibrium, so tends to evolve towards some equilibrium. So there is some decay. Okay, this we can measure independently, information we can measure independently. And what we obtain is the following. So in fact, this fits very, very well. So this is what we, we can calculate the derivative of information explicitly and compare it with this approximation and you see that indeed it's this agrees very very well okay so in few more minutes i don't know how much time so, i have so, so you just you have published the paper about all this and in in paper you just said that okay so we use this uh, uh, this file this image uh, compression to measure the information yeah yeah we published it yes okay so the idea is not ours but we applied it so it's so uh, this idea was uh, not us. Uh, it came from Paul Chaikin. So 
Okay, so it's, uh, it's going this way. This idea came from Paul Chaikin. If you, you know this person, probably, right? Uh, this, uh, he wrote a textbook on condensed metaphysics. Yeah, so this is what they published a few years ago, too. So it's, uh, and this, we use this idea. Okay, now let's so move this is, sorry, so this is just a re really uh, now this formal approach to measure the yeah, information yeah, in some two D. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's a formal way to measure it. And now let me go in last of my talk. I go it was a little bit of science fiction. Okay, so now we make so chemicals waves are very slow. So now let's agent communicate via acoustic or electromagnetic waves. Nothing prohibits it, right? So we can implement it in robots or we can implement it in something else. So now we say that we have the same system, but now all agents, they emit waves in three-dimensional space. The agents live in two-dimensional habitat, so we call it habitat, they put seal in 2D, but they emit waves in 3D space. And each agent has an oscillator and uh, so a loudspeaker and a microphone. So each agent emits waves via the loudspeaker, and each agent listens to the neighbors and adjusts its frequency according to the average signal. And then it moves in the direction of the strongest signal. Essentially the same idea, but now it's uh, more acoustic waves oriented. So now we assume that uh, agents emit acoustic signals, and signals propagate in three-dimensional space, and we need to solve this uh, three-dimensional uh, wave equation. Why do you stress 3D if they only live in 2D? Are there some uh, reflections from the third dimension? Yes, yes. So if you solve a wave equation in 2D, you have unphysical divergences. Yes. If... 2D is unphysical. Yes. I mean, in a sense, all your real agents yes. live in some kind of... Agents, kind of agents, live, agents live in two-dimensional habitat, but acoustic wave travel in 3D. Um, okay, so if we can, can find acoustic field in 2D, we have a lot of uh, technical problems too. Also, and it's, why, also, why do stress on the frequencies? The, the, frequen frequencies. the frequencies are included here, this uh, complex amplitude of each oscillator. And we assume also that uh, velocity of the agents are much smaller than the velocity of sound. So it's quite static, so they move very slow, they emit signals that, uh, and react. And again, how does the agent uh, uh, tune his own uh, frequency, please? Yes, this is the next slide. Okay, so each oscillator is a Landau oscillator, very similar. So with the same frequencies. And uh, this term describes a nonlinear frequency shift. And U includes uh, acoustic field generated by all agents. So all agents, they modify acoustic soundscape, which they produce. And what you, what you anticipate that because of this coupling, so coupling comes here. So they listen acoustic field from everyone, according to this wave equation. And you may uh, anticipate uh, synchronization. OK, so. Uh, there is an interesting connection between this model. So each agent is an oscillator, and the coupling comes from here. There is an interesting model to Kuramoto model. May I ask me? Yeah. Like you have AJs everywhere except for the second term on the run. Ah, it's a misprint, OK. What is the mean? Oh, no, it's a misprint. So. Ah, misprint. I wondered what happened. No, 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 it's a misprint. You can simplify the system a little bit. You can assume that the amplitude of each oscillator is constant and only phase are different. And then you can reduce it to a model which looks like a Kuramoto model for a couple of oscillators, but with the difference that in Kuramoto model, the coupling matrix is fixed. It's, uh, but in this model, the coupling matrix is dynamically modified. Okay, so you can solve this now. And so what happens is it uh, looks like from uh, science fiction. This is what you see. 
So agents self-organize in these structures and they behave like living beings. So you see snakes, you see slowly moving creatures we call larvae and other things. And each of these things has its unique acoustic signature. So you, in fact, you don't need many. So each dot is an agent and uh, color is its face. So and snakes in, may include as many as like 20 agents only. Yes. Uh, we actually didn't figure it out that there is typical size of not probably there is. Well, this seems to be... Uh, but if you make bigger systems, they keep growing. Mm -hmm. right? So it has been consistent size. Yes, some of them can grow, some don't. So that's really hard to, hard to answer. So it's... Okay, so we have a variety in the entire zoo of these creatures. And each has its unique acoustic signature. So, you know, like... And in principle, you can distinguish them by acoustic signature like a good... Uh, submarine sonar operator can identify enemy submarine by its acoustic signature. Okay. Yes. Yeah, can you tell like the what, which kind of this uh, entities will survive in open boundary conditions? I think they really don't care too much about boundary conditions. So all of them are. I would think so. Yes, so they emit sound. It goes away. So yes. Okay, I can't. Try to play a little bit of sound which is generated by each of them. Uh, but sound we don't hear. Oh, yeah. This is larvae. This is snake. So red uh, dot is the microphone. This uh, creature, it's a snake which eats, eats its own tail. And it's a Nordic uh, folk uh, it's, uh, mythology is uh, uh, called Araborus. And this is thing which it's a block which is decorated by the Rowling wave, we call a wall box, a resequential like that too. In the... But it uh, emits very faint sound. Okay. okay, so what is interesting, so these uh, entities, which are, they have unique capability, which is from science fiction. So I remember, I believe everyone knows uh, Terminator 2, very unpleasant guy, very hard to kill, and has this uh, capability to walk through these obstacles, uh, constrictions, did a lot of troubles. Uh, the good guys. Yeah. So snakes can do something like that too. So we generated a snake in front of the constriction. And the snake is originally the bigger than the constriction, it can go through. And uh, eventually it breaks apart, but then pick up the pieces and hits its merry way. Hmm. Again, so we don't do anything here, so they decide what to do, right? So uh, this uh, object, they have unique uh, capability to regenerate original shapes. So this is another object, it's a larva. Uh, it has a head, head here. And Keto was a pacemaker, it produces weight, which stabilizes larvae. And we uh, did something really inhumane, we chop a head of larvae, and larvae grows it back the head again. So if we chop the head, it emits some material, but then it uh, picks it up uh, from behind and again goes its own. Okay, this is another demonstration of functionality. So it's a directed transfer. So this we have a snake, and then we project it an acoustic signal, acoustic beam somewhere here. And then we move, we captured the snake, we move this beam and then release released it at somewhere else. So the snake goes its way. 
do any project acoustic signal, so it captures the snake, it completely destroys it, and then moves it around, and then we release the appears. And finally, so the last capability, which is really interesting, so it's this uh, structure, they have, uh, they are able to detect an intruder from outer space. This is why we use three-dimensional uh, wave equation. So, so they live in two-dimensional uh, habitat, but they emit waves in three-dimensional space. And now imagine that we have an object which comes above the habitat, and the waves reflect from this uh, object. So it's an intruder from outer space. And uh, they can detect these waves and reorganize. Yes, it effectively it completely reorganizes upon a signal. I think I finish now, and you can ask more questions. So it's uh, synergetic effect of propulsion and decision making, the multiplicity and hierarchy of model dynamic states, uh, long distance propagation of information and communications between the uh, collective states enable more functionality, especially decision making. And there are many generalizations. Uh, it's uh, like acoustic, electromagnetic, surface waves, mechanical waves. And hypothetically, it's, um, we may think about new uh, control and command uh, algorithms for simple micro robotics worms. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Igor, for this very exciting presentation. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question about your previous slide. This effect of disassembly is it just from the reflection of yes. the acoustic wave, or you include some Doppler shift? Maybe? No, no, we don't include Doppler shift. No, uh, uh, they move very slow, so that's you can neglect it. Mm -hmm. uh, but is this uh, the object can move fast. Yes, right. But uh, if it moves fast, it would probably not have time to react. So it's okay. so it just uh, object doesn't move at all. So it's okay. I think you can you assume the still that is like periodic boundary, right? Yes. You change the triangle or three point of rotation. Same page diagram. Yes, we can change the boundary conditions and. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, there is a boundary guidance in this case. So there, some of them, it depends also interaction, uh, if, if sound is reflected or sound is absorbed. But in most of the cases, we observe uh, boundary guidance. So this, they move around the boundary. Did you, did you not this or this you change the... This one? No, no, no. Previous topic, not the this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get it. Go, go back. Go back. Or... Chemical reactions. Yeah, yeah. Uh. The case is uh, the center of position is just, just located chemical, right? But you change the boundary. You you, you can check the this one. chemical. Chem, uh, yeah. Yeah, change the not the three fold. Well, your different periodic boundary condition. Yes. Maybe stripe type is uh, uh, only on, I, I, my I should emphasize that uh, boundary conditions are really not important for these objects because uh, they emit waves. And these waves collide with the boundary and absorb there. So that really doesn't come back. So they, they are very robust in this respect. It's like your question, the period boundary condition. Yes, the periodic boundary condition, but uh, this uh, wave emitting objects, they break the symmetry. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. So it's, I spent a lot of time doing that for the spiral waves. So the spiral waves really don't care about the boundaries, usually, because they emit waves, information propagates outwards. If they hit the boundary, so there is no reflection back, usually. So that's why the boundary conditions are not that important. Unless you uh, produce some chemical signals there. So that's a different story. And can yes. How crucial noise is the, what happened without noise in the final models? Uh, so uh, 
which model comes in the final model yeah final model is the sound wave I uh, don't really have any noise there. No. It means this dynamics is not uh, noise is not crucial in this. The noise time. is not crucial. No, I don't think we have any noise. And was, as far as I remember, we switch it off. In previous model, what happened without noise? Is it similar or different? Uh, without noise, uh, so all the uh, it's, no in which model without noise we will have uh, all uh, ordered state. So we will have one big band of particles moving together without noise. Uh, in this system, so without noise, uh, I don't think much will change, in fact. So it's, it's uh, this uh, structures will, will have a sharper boundary, but they will not change. Because it's dynamics is, noise, not, is not noise driven. Yes. It's simple noise. Is it also possible for opposite and this collective behavior can you expect some sort of a simple rule? Yeah, I think so. I showed in the beginning that humans they show very simple behavior when they got stuck in the front of the door. That's a good question. I'm not, I say uh, maybe. So we're trying to do that for some different system, not for this one. This may be a little bit too complex. So we're currently trying to do uh, something what you ask for bacterial turbulence. So the idea is to have a experimental video and to reconstruct equations from the video. And it works. Uh, a little not perfectly, but so you, in fact you can do it in certain limits. Uh, here I'm a little less pessimist, optimistic, so it's this is really complex behavior. <laughs> Maybe it's possible, yeah. So it's but it, it depends what kind of so what you can do the following. So you can select a base model and use experimental observation to calibrate the parameters of the model. I think this is maybe possible. But you need to come up with the model first. So if you know the model, yes, but uh, if, but I don't think you can derive the model from the, directly from the observations. You need some little bit more information. You need some additional insights. So there are some uh, there is an activity to generate equation of motion from observables, but uh, usually you need some additional information. Yes. Yes, it, it, they both have decision making, but it's different type of decision making. Uh, no, I'm just uh, Then you have something like Kuramoto model. A little bit more general Kuramoto model, and you would expect some global synchronization, something like that. But uh, it will be frozen in time. So this, so the whole uh, beauty of this, it's, it's like a Kuramoto model which can re reorganize itself. Why is the third dimension not important? Why always just two dimensions? Well, it's uh, most of this uh, active materialization usually are two-dimensional because you need to supply energy from somewhere and in 3D they consume energy so you will have they run out of food very fast. So yeah, but more bacteria and then all the other organisms which you introduced at the beginning and, and so, so on. So, on, so okay, this is uh, okay. Bacteria, this uh, amoeba, they live in two-dimensional space. They they live on the surface. So bacteria, swimming bacteria, they can swim in the bulk of the suspension, but they usually they consume food very fast and they accumulate on the top and, and the bottom. So they really like don't like 3D. So it, uh, and uh, to my best knowledge, I don't know good three-dimensional realization of active matter. But I'm sure you tried, or someone else tried, to go 3D and to see are these things still there, or are they suddenly all gone? 
Uh, no, they are still there, yes. So you can solve Wifik model in 3D and you still have the same things. Uh, and uh, th this, uh, no, if talk about uh, the last part, so if you, so our robots are on in 2D, but you can imagine drones. So drones can be in 3D, and I think it's uh, quite possible to generalize it in 3D. Swarms of drones make perfect sense. <laughs> Enemy come from everywhere, yes. Sir. Okay, more questions? Seem to be all the way last. Oh, you have, yeah. yeah. This I don't think so. So that's a macroscopic entities. So it's a, uh, and uh, quantum active matter is really something very exotic. Because it's really hard to organize self propulsion on quantum scale. Yeah, so you need to be out of equilibrium from the beginning, yes. Okay, let's uh, then maybe finish and thank you again for the thank you.